search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise and treasures that fade Are never enough And you came along And put me back together that you've given us this time to gather into your house, to sing praises to your name, to gather around this table of remembrance, and to be stirred and inspired to greater service in your kingdom. Father, we ask that our worship here this morning will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Bless all families represented here in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated for a moment. Good morning and welcome. It's good to see everyone. If you're visiting with us, we'd like for you to fill out the visitor card in the pew in front of you and place that in the offering plate when it's passed in front of you. And all others, if you have any prayer requests, please put that on the other side, on the prayer request side, and we'll be sure to pray for the people you put on there, whatever concern. There will be a brief meeting in the kids' church room for all who plan to go to the boys camp out on April the 15th. Also permission slips for the camp out are due next, due before next Sunday. Please see Nikki if you're planning to go and you want to sign up. There will be a men's Emmaus walk the last weekend of April and we have a link on our website with more information. If you would like to purchase an Easter lily in memory or honor of a loved one, please fill out the card in the bulletin and place that in the offering plate. 
And then finally, our Easter services are on the back of your bulletin, and we hope you'll join us. We're going to be having a candlelight communion service on April the 15th. And then on Easter Sunday, we'll have a 7 a.m. A sunrise service followed by our breakfast at 9, and then we'll be having a unity service in here at our normal time, 1030. We're glad you're here this morning. Let's continue with our worship, if you'll be standing. You call me out of
pleasure and privilege to share with you this morning a few thoughts about this event that we are going to, in which we are going to partake. We call it communion or the Last Supper. It was actually a Passover meal that Jesus ate with his disciples. And in that, during that Passover meal, he asked them to do something. Actually, he commanded them to do something. He said, partake of this bread and this cup in remembrance of me. Now, he's commanded us to do this, to partake of these emblems that are set before us. And that begs the question, well, just what are we supposed to remember? I think the answer is simple. It's anything and everything that Jesus said and did, particularly the events and instructions 
surrounding his ultimate sacrifice for you and me. Today I want to reflect on three verses Jesus spoke on that night before he was betrayed. We find those verses in John 14, the first through the third verses. And by the way, chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 of John present enough sermon topics to last a lifetime. Jesus was so thorough in his instructions. In any case, John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You trust in God, trust also in me. My Father's house has many dwelling places. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. We're going to see that these verses are meant to be comforting for the disciples, and they needed comforting, didn't they? They were in quite a lather because Jesus had dropped several long, large bombs on them during the meal. He said to them, I'm leaving you, and where I'm going, you can't come. He said they would desert him. He said one of them would betray him. He told Peter he would deny that he even knew him. He told them he would be beaten and ultimately crucified. That was a lot to digest in a short period of time. And he could sense that his disciples were troubled in heart. He knew that when he spoke these words and that they would continue to be troubled for three more days. The Greek word we use as troubled means agitated or stirred up. And Jesus is basically saying, don't worry. Now, if Jesus had stopped there, that would have been pretty hollow, wouldn't it? I mean, don't people tell us all the time not to worry? Don't worry about that. Does that have any impact on us at all? Not unless they can solve our problem for which we are worrying. No, it's pretty hollow when somebody says, don't worry, because that's just not easy to do. But Jesus didn't stop there. He said, you trust in God, trust also in me. Now, some translations use the word believe. You believe in God, believe also in me. What Jesus meant was so much more than believing. Even Satan and his demons believe that God exists and Jesus is his son. What Jesus is saying is you have entrusted yourselves to God. Entrust yourself to me. For I am trustworthy and I'm going to prove it to you. In my father's house are many dwelling places or rooms. The King James Version says mansions. And that's a nice thought, isn't it? We would be staying in one of God's mansions. Well, that's not what the word means. Whatever the Father's house looks like, it is indescribable from our standpoint. It means dwelling places, rooms, if you will. I'd like to think there's room for everyone in the Father's house. The next statement Jesus makes, in my opinion, has long been misunderstood and as a result, misapplied. It is true that he went to prepare a place for us so we could be with him, but he didn't have to build anything. He hasn't added on to the Father's house. When he said he was going to prepare a place for us, I am convinced he meant I'm going to the cross. Only through his death on the cross could Jesus make a way for us to be with him in the Father's house. Finally, Jesus says, if I go, I will come back and get you so that you can be where I am. This passage is part of a traditional Jewish wedding vow. The bridegroom, after the betrothal, would return to his father's house to make everything ready for his bride. And when all was ready, at just the right time, the bridegroom would return and take his bride to be with him. 
And that's the way Jesus sees us, his church, a beautifully adorned with righteousness bride. If that's not comforting, I don't know what is. John, in his revelation, put it this way. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Let not your hearts be troubled as we pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you for this time that we have to quietly gather around your table to partake of these two emblems, the bread that reminds us of Jesus' body and the cup that reminds us of his blood shed for us, the new covenant. Father, we thank you that you've given us your word. We thank you that you cared enough for us to leave instructions that we can simply follow. Father, we ask your blessing on us this morning as we partake that we might show the love of Jesus by reaching out and serving others. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. I mentioned in my class this morning that um, it was necessary for us to renew the insurance policies on the church this past, well, today, actually. And underwriters, insurance underwriters, can be very nosy people. And one of the things they asked us to do is fill out an application. And they asked all sorts of questions, like, well, does your church do this? Does it do that? Does it do this other thing? And as we went through the list of the things that we do, it reminded me, we do a lot. Um, we have a lot of things going on in this church. 
And it wouldn't be possible without the fact that I firmly believe this congregation has, has done what Jesus instructed not only us personally, but the church in general. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added. We couldn't do it if we weren't actively seeking the will of God, the kingdom of God. This is an act of worship now as we give back to the Lord what he has so generously given us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for this congregation. We thank you for its leadership. We thank you for every family that that makes Central Christian Church their church home. Father, we, we do eagerly seek your face. We eagerly seek to do your will. We eagerly seek your kingdom. We just ask your blessing on us that we may continue to to do the work that you have placed before us and that you will grant the increase. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. morning church family today's reading comes from the book of leviticus chapter 17 verse 11 for the life of a creature is in the blood and i have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life zechariah thir- chapter 13 verse 1 on that day a fountain will be open to the house of david and the inhabitants of jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. If you've been attending here a long time, bear with me. You've heard all my stories and jokes, but there are new people here, and so I will share a a, a story from my childhood. You listen to all Melvin's things about uh, World War II and and things like that. So anyway, when I was a kid, our family lived in West Africa, and when I was about five years old, my sister was probably seven, she and I were climbing up in a mango tree near the campus where my dad taught, and I remember coming face to face with a praying mantis. Now, the Africans had told us as little kids that if a praying mantis got near you, he would crawl up you and go up into your brain and eat your brains out. He'd go up your nose. 
And so I was terrified. And so I tried to scramble down that tree and lost my, my grab on the tree, my hold, fell, and I have a scar to this day, one of many scars I would get as I was growing up. And on the way home, I started noticing my blood dripping, and I remember saying to my sister, I'm going to bleed to death, and her saying, you won't bleed to death. And so I have this picture, I couldn't find it, but they wrapped my head up with this massive bandage for this, like a one and a half or one and a sixteenth inch scar here above my left eye. And so today's sermon topic, there's a fountain, or our, our song that we're looking at today, there's a fountain filled with blood. Now that sounds pretty gross, unless you're in the medical field. In our modern sanitized world, we don't grow up on farms, and so when we hear about that, it just makes some of us cringe. I actually had one preacher say that a woman told him, all this talk about blood is giving my kids nightmares. I wish you would stop. And I would love to get to Resurrection Sunday and skip over all the blood, but it's impossible. And so many of our older hymns, uh, contain the word blood, talk about blood, give you a few examples here. Nothing but the blood of Jesus we sing. There's a hymn, When I See the Blood, and we all know there is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood, the blood of the Lamb. And the blood, the word blood is used in the King James 447 times, 375 verses talk about blood, and 43 references are found to the blood of Jesus. And I believe that's just in the New Testament. And so that I want to just consider not so much this hymn. William Cowper wrote this hymn. He struggled most of his life with depression. And he wrote this hymn even when he was very depressed because it still gave him hope after this life. But there are some considerations I'd like to look at this morning for a few minutes. The first one is that blood is precious, and it shows how much God really loves us and how much we are valued to him, how much value he puts on us. And the second idea when I think about it is that it, sh it has some practical qualities that can be used to illustrate the spiritual lessons in our life. And then the third main idea is that blood, while it's graphic, it drives home the seriousness of sin, and it helps us to understand so many key theological ideas like the atonement, justification, propitiation, and I won't get into all those uh, words this morning, but they can't be understood without thinking about the blood of Christ. And so first of all, blood is precious. Leviticus 17.11 that Esther read forbade the drinking of blood, using blood for anything like that, because it was considered sacred. The life is in the blood. You know, for a while, medical people thought that if you drain the blood out of the body, it would get rid of all the impurities and they would be healed quicker. And some historians say that even George Washington suffered when he was uh, having a fever. They drained his blood and they took too much blood out of him and he ended up dying. But the Bible tells us that blood is precious. The life is in the blood, and therefore God forbade anyone from uh, drinking it. Peter said that it's, it's the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. It's also called by John the cleansing blood. And in the book of Revelation, it's called the washing of the blood that we can think about that stresses the removing of our sins. The third verse of our hymn this morning, Dear dying lamb, that thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God are safe to sin no more. Are safe to sin no more. The precious blood he puts in that text when he gives us that great hymn. Literally, we know that blood is precious, as I just mentioned. And right now I'm told that they still can't come up with a perfect substitute for blood. After 70 years of research and all the scientists working on it, they can come up with some substitutes, but they're not the same. They, they are trying to copy it, but it says, I read this, it must 
be able to mimic the ability of the red blood cells to carry oxygen and most of the human blood substitute products in advanced phases of t clinical trials of derivatives of hemoglobin and are called hemoglobin-based oxygen carriers, but it's still not the same. God made the perfect fluid. Our son who's in the service was talking about tourniquets because years ago when I was in, they said don't put tourniquets on because they will cause the limb to die. And then they changed it over the years and, and they realized how many lives have been saved by stopping the flow of the blood and uh, that the limb could live a lot longer than they used to think. And the correct use of tourniquets and the survivability rates from battlefield wounds that averaged 89.8 in Iraq, 91.4 in Afghanistan, compared to 76 in Vietnam and 78.2 in the Korean War, and only 70.7% during World War II. They realized that putting a tourniquet on, and now they have them for the abdomen even, could save lives. So after the fall of man, after God gave man everything he needed in the garden, we're starting to look at Genesis in Sunday school now, men began to desire the mo most precious food for them was the eating of meat. They wanted to eat meat. As time went on, it became a man's food. I'm a, a hunter, I'm a carnivore. If you go out to Rudy's, they have a sign. I, I didn't climb to the top of the food chain to eat vegetables or something like that. And it became the food of the wealthy as well. The privileged ate meat and lots of it. And then they got gout and everything else. But we'll go on. I digress. Uh, cultures were built around eating meat. We somehow just craved it. And I know some of you are vegetarians and vegans and we pray for you every day. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but cultures were built around eating meat. They had to eat it to survive. The Native Americans lived off of the bison. That was their lifeblood. Some on the west coast lived off of the salmon, but we realized that many of the Plains Indians or Native Americans lived off of the bison. And then when we think about the northern tribes, they lived off of herding and, and eating caribou, which we call reindeer over in Europe. The Maasai and many of the tribes related to them in, West, in uh, East Africa and Southern Africa, they live off of their cattle. That's all they eat. They're totally carnivorous, carnivorous people. Uh, the Polynesians, they craved meat, and sometimes they would eat each other. Uh, the Arab and the Bedouin tribes, they ate their camels, and they built a whole culture around them. And so every culture, the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, love to eat meat. And the only way you can get meat is to do what? Something has to die, right? So if it's your most precious food, then wouldn't you want to offer to your gods or your god the best that you have? And that's what God built upon that. And we see in the very beginning, God kills animals to clothe Adam and Eve. And after that, Noah or Cain and Abel offer sacrifices. And, and the one that has blood in it seems to please God more. And then we find out after they get off of the ark that Noah begins to sacrifice animals. And that goes on through the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they became herders of prized animals that they wanted to eat above all other things. Abraham killed the calf when the visitors came to warn him about Sodom. Isaac, you remember he loved that wild game stew that his son Esau would bring him. And when the Israelites were brought out of captivity, they understood this. They had been in Egypt. God gave them the most perfect food, manna. But what did they start complaining about? They wanted some meat. And so he gives them quail. And so we see it going on. Even the vegetarian cultures, the cultures of Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism, Shintoism, and all the other isms of the East, they loved meat as well until about 400 B.C. when they found that it would build better karma not to kill things 
And so they started abstaining from eating meat. That doesn't mean they didn't like to eat it. And so the blood of animals was offered as a sacrifice. And God used what people already knew in their hearts. And he demanded the best that they have. You and I probably, we hide the best. We may not want to break out the best when our company comes. But God says, I want the best. Farmers today will keep the best for future stock. But God says, no, I want the, your perfect sacrifice. And so it foreshadows what will happen when God gives us his best by sending Jesus, the perfect Passover lamb, who dies on the cross for our sins. Second of all, blood is a perfect is the perfect fluid or material to illustrate and portray God's love for us. There's so many, while it's a real thing, it's also very symbolic and it can apply to our spiritual needs. The first one is transportation. Real blood transports our oxygen, our hormones, our, our waste, our kidneys, our nutrients, our glucose, and all of this. It's just a, a miracle fluid. And when we apply that to a spiritual application, Jesus' blood can transfer everything that we need in this life to help us. He's like oxygen for our souls coming through his blood, and he supplies us all we need. Second of all, real blood protects. We know that the white blood cells go into gear to protect us against infection, and the platelets will go from the red blood cells, and they will clot when you've been wounded. And wow, what a great illustration there. The blood of Jesus also protects us as we go through this life. He protects us, I believe, physically at times, but I know he does spiritually all the time. And then the blood also, real blood, regulates. Blood regulates the factors of the body, the temperature, so that it doesn't get too hot or too cold. And we know that Jesus, if we'll allow him, he will regulate our life as we go through life and help us keep our priorities in the right place. And then I want to talk about blood and also the crucifixion because they are a graphic reminder when we think about sin and the seriousness of sin. We make a lot of jokes about sin. We call it misgivings, missteps, faults. The Bible calls it sin and it's the reason that Jesus suffered so graphically on the cross because sin is not to be taken lightly. Not to pick on the Eastern folks, but Eastern religions don't believe in the concept of sin. They believe that it's ignorance. And they believe that by being reborn through good works, your karma, over and over and over again, eventually you'll get close enough that you'll be enter into nirvana where you will no longer have any problems. You'll just be one with the universe. They don't have the same concept. So they don't really believe that, that what we do on this earth in rebellion against God is sin. But as Christians, we believe that God created us and he has defined actions that are acceptable and those that are not. We know about sins of commission and sometimes sins of omission. And the Bible makes it clear that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. And so we believe that God alone can judge what's right and what's wrong. And he has administered that justice to us according to his holy standard. However, the world today has rejected the Bible as just being another book, not something you can rely on, something written by a bunch of male chauvinist men, some say, people that were ignorant, they say. And so they've rejected the idea of absolute truth, that some things are sinful and some things are not, and they've gone into what we call cultural relativism. And that means that truth is only local, truth is only uh, what it appears to you, that there really are no absolutes when it comes to right and wrong, that your right is your right and my wrong and your wrong is your wrong, but that can't be applied to me. And that no system of truth is better than another. There is no ultimate standard. And so we see our society today a product of that teaching that's gone on for years. Opinion and morality and ethics are subject to cultural perspective. Ultimately, this means there is no moral or ethical system that is best or worst. 
right or wrong. And yet little kids will say, is he a good guy or is he a bad guy when they're watching something? Why? Do, how, well, son, I won't tell you if he's a good guy or a bad guy because I'm not sure what good is or what bad is. According to his culture, it's okay for him to do such and such. And so for him, he's really a good guy. And we're all confused, amen? And the loose way our modern society defines these grounds is relativism. Today, many people agree that there just can't be an absolute truth. And so the majority will decide, according to the society, what's right and what's wrong. In the Native American tribes, if you could steal my horse and you could kill me, that made you a good guy. And if I could do the same to you, that'd be okay. In some cultures, even today, if you want your stuff, you need to lock it up and put chain link around it and put barbed wire and hire security guards because it's your responsibility. Because God or my culture teaches me that I should try to take your stuff and you should try to protect it. Even today in Papua New Guinea, a lot of men believe it's okay to punch a woman in the face. And you look at our culture. Everybody's screaming, hey, you can't go up and just slap somebody for telling a joke about your wife. You can't do that. No, you can't invade a country, a sovereign nation, and blow their buildings and schools up. That's wrong. People believe there is a universal right and wrong. Why do they believe that? Because God put that in their hearts. And so we know it has to be atoned for. Back to one of my childhood stories. When I was a kid, I was playing with glass bottles near our house. I was probably five, and I was breaking the glass. My dad, I hope he, hopefully you won't be able to hear me this morning. So. Turn it down for us. So... I'm over there near the house, five years old, and it's really fun breaking bottles again, and I get another scar on my hand. And I run home, I'm bleeding! And my parents say, how'd you cut yourself? And I said, on glass. But they thought I said grass. And my dad says, yeah, grass will cut you. And I thought, that gets me off the hook. But it bothered my conscience because I was lying. I wasn't being honest. I didn't actually lie, but I went along with what he thought he heard because I knew I'd probably get a spanking for playing with glass bottles. I knew better even at that age. And so guilt comes in, and guilt must be atoned for. Even primitive people realize that when the crops are failing and when there's plagues among the people, the gods must be angry at us, and we have not been good people, and we need to do something about it. And so they would shed blood, and, and God knew that as well. He knew that they knew they needed their, their sins forgiven. And so he prepares a system. When I was a kid in Africa, there's voodoo shrines everywhere with juju men or voodoo men, and they, they have blood all over them from chickens and goats, and they're trying to atone for their, the sins of their people. Someone's wanting to get pregnant, or somebody wants to get back at an enemy, and they're, they're paying these, these pagan, I believe, demonic gods to fulfill their promise. And God's saying, I have already sent the one who's died for everybody's sins. You just need to come to him in faith and obedience. God used a system of atonement for humanity, which we already understood. And he set guidelines for it as well. It's God who said, he told them how to do it the right way. He lays the groundwork. He forbade human sacrifices. He forbade cannibalism that was going on all over the world. Some places in the thousands of per day were being sacrificed. God showed the sacredness of life and he said, don't drink this blood. God set up a difference between clean and unclean sacrifices. He set up a system that allowed us to, to respectfully take the animal's life and to put the blood on the altar in the right way. He said, what portions of meat you can eat and what you can't eat. And animal sacrifices, though, were not enough. They only rolled the sins back for another year. The Day of Atonement, and then you had to do it over and over and over again. 
And the blood of Jesus is a sacrifice once and for all. For the law, since it has only a shadow of good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year after year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year after year, for it is impossible for the blood of goats to take away sins. Someone please go get the kids if we haven't already. He did not enter by the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place for all of his own, by his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. For the goats and bulls and the ashes and the heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that their bodies are clean. How much more did the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, purifying our conscience from works of death so that we may serve the living God. Yes, blood is graphic, but sin is horrible. It's dark, it's evil, and it has to be paid for. And so God set up that system. He sent his son into this world to die on the cross for our sins. That if you believe that, that you should come to him in faith and obedience. Repent of your sins. Be willing to confess him and be baptized into him. We're going to have a baptism. And James, he's, he's not very tall in stature. But the Bible says, except you become as one of these except you become as a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so you say, well, that's just for the kids. No, all of us need to carry out and obey what God has told us to do. So as we stand and sing, if you have a decision this morning, won't you come? There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners must be heaped at blood, lose all their guilty sins. Good morning. You can be seated. This morning, James Voss has come forward with his parents, and he has expressed his desire to be baptized, and he doesn't have to know everything about the Bible. None of us do, but he has to make that good confession. And so I'm going to ask you, James, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for your sins? Yes. Okay. And will you say after me, I believe? That Jesus, is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Son of the living God. And do you want to be baptized at this time? Yes. All right.
Let's stand. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, as we leave your house this morning, please stay with us, stay with our hearts. Help us to be more like you in all the things that we do. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better. Show you my weakness.